لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله. Um, there's a lot of different thoughts and a lot that has probably been talked about and been said. I mean, the Sheikh is here, alhamdulillah. Um, there was just a thought that crossed my mind a little bit earlier today, something I was reflecting and thinking on, and I addressed it with my own community uh, during the khatara, uh, during the taraweeh prayers. And I felt it would be appropriate to talk about it here again tonight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He tells us, إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, most definitely this ummah of yours. And what's very interesting is that, you know, the, the language of the Qur'an is very specific. And everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He says it in a very, very specific manner and fashion, and He says it in a specific manner for a specific reason. Nothing is coincidental, nothing is accidental, nothing is per chance, everything is precise. So Allah says, in the most definitely this ummah chukum. This construction, well basically, I'm not gonna try, I'm not gonna make it too technical, inshallah. But this construction, ummah tukum, is what we call idafa. It associates one thing with another thing. So we say Baytullah, the house of God, the house of Allah. It's an association. The house belongs to Allah. We say Kitabullah, the book of Allah. The book belongs to Allah. Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah, meaning that the messenger is appointed by Allah. So Allah says, Ummatukum, your nation, your ummah, your family. And so Allah actually gives us ownership of the ummah. And I want you to start thinking about what does that ownership really mean? What's the purpose of this ownership? I want you to try to understand it from the perspective of one's own family. I have a wife, I have two children. That is my family, ahli, my family. And I take ownership of my family. I feel responsibility towards my family. I feel a sense of pride in regards to my family. I feel a sense of protectiveness in regards to my family. Right? Very protective, very cautious, very careful, responsible, concerned, aware, informed. So Allah says, this is your ummah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ummatan, that what is your ummah? One ummah. So, the word ummatan in and of itself, it means one ummah. The meaning of one is already built into the word. But then Allah says the word wahidatan after saying ummatan. So that's what we would normally call repetition. Right? Ummatan already means one ummah, and then Allah says the word one again. And that type of repetition denotes emphasis. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this singular, one singular ummah is your ummah. So two things that we learn here. First and foremost, Allah is emphasizing the fact that this is one family. You are one family. You are one ummah. And the second thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now telling us here is so take ownership. Take responsibility. Develop concern, awareness, cognizance, consideration, affection, responsibility for your family. And I wanted to talk about this concept of the ummah you know, and, and to further elaborate on it, the Qur'an is of course full, the ahadith are full of references to the same fact, and I wanted to kind of, uh, us to dig a little deeper, rather than just quote a dozen ayat and ahadith, I wanted us to dig a little deeper. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's off the top, uh, it just, it's obvious. Allah says, in the ikhwah. The most definitely, without a doubt, the believers, they are ikhwatun. Ikhwa means brothers and sisters. Right, but what's fascinating again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't leave anything to mystery. So specific, so precise. So the word akh means brother, ukht means sister. The plural, actually there are two plurals. And both are used in the Qur'an. One plural is ikhwan, means brothers and sisters. Sisters automatically included. And the second one is ikhwatun. The difference between the two plurals, because there's got to be some difference, right? One is used in one place, the other used. So what's the specific difference? The difference is that the word ikhwatun refers to biological siblings, like blood relations, like one's actual blood, 
where you share a mother or a father or both. That's called ikhwa. And that's why in the verses, in the ayat about inheritance, the inheritance law, the word ikhwatun is used. Because those are biological siblings that you share inheritance with. The word ikhwan, referring to brothers and sisters, is more figurative. It's more broad in its meaning. So it doesn't just refer to biological siblings, it can, but it refers to just any type of brotherhood, sisterhood, fraternity that we might have, association that we might have. And that's why when Allah talks about the people who work with the shaytan, Allah refers to them, refers to them as ikhwanu shayateen. Right? Inna al-mubadhirina kanu ikhwanu shayateen. They are the brothers of shaytan, not literally the biological siblings of shaytan, but they are aligning themselves with shaytan, so Allah uses the word ikhwan. Based off of this understanding that you have now, this ayah in Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah number 49, all the believers, we are not all biological siblings. If we were, it would be very problematic. Nobody could get married, right? That would be kind of an issue, right? So we're not biological siblings. So the actual, from my simple-minded logic, my limited brain, my brain tells me that the word ikhwan is more appropriate here. The believers are all brothers and sisters figuratively. But that's not the word Allah used. Allah used the word ikhwatun. Even though we are not biological, biologically all siblings, but Allah used the word ikhwatun to emphasize the fact that yes, our brotherhood and sisterhood might be one that is figurative through the bonds of faith Islamically, but in its strength, and in its love, and its affection, and its concern, and its responsibility, it needs to be no different than the way I feel about my own biological siblings. And that takes work, doesn't it? How do you care about a complete stranger no differently than how you care about your own blood? That takes work. But that's exactly what Allah is emphasizing here. That's the sense of ummah. You know, and that's why even the word ummah, you know, we can translate as nation and uh, family or whatever followers or... But I feel like the word ummah in and of itself is just such a unique, special word. Uh, it's my own limitation. I have trouble finding any other word that captures the essence of ummah. So I'm just going to use that word ummah. Allah is teaching us ummahness. Like how to be an ummah. This is that sense of ummah that we need to develop. And so the reason why I bring this up and I talk about this is that because our ummah, just like any other family, comes in all shapes and sizes, different experiences, different backgrounds. And it's very important, it's difficult again, but it's very important that we come out of our comfort zones and we learn to embrace our ummah, our family, our believing family. And we're here in the last few nights of the month of Ramadan And I'll tell you the reason why I felt obligated to talk about this today There are people in our communities There might be some folks here tonight Whose wife is upstairs You know, their children are running around Their brothers and sisters, like actual siblings Are a 15-20 minute drive away Or a phone call or a text message away Parents are down the street, uncles and aunts. And so you've been busy and having your thought at a different home of a family member, you know, all throughout the month of Ramadan. You're coming here and meeting at Qiyam together, your kids are playing together. And now Eid preparations are going on and the kids are buying gifts for each other and preparing little things for one another. Some of us might be blessed enough to be able to enjoy that. But we would be we would be sorely mistaken if we assumed that everybody else is enjoying that same blessing. But people are coming from different backgrounds. And some people might not have those blessings. Not to touch on anything that might cause strong emotions, bring up strong emotions, or be a sore point for someone. But we have converts or reverts in our communities. I, I, knew, I knew a very good friend, somebody I became very close to, he accepted Islam. And nobody else in his family accepted Islam. Till today. May Allah SWT guide them. And he told me that before I met you, he said for the first 10 years, because the rest of the family, they didn't kick him out and all that tragic stuff, but still the rest of the family kind of looked at him like something's off about him. You know, the alien in the family, kind of weird guy. 
And he said that, so obviously there's no Eid to celebrate with my own family. They don't know what, they don't know what Eid is. Nor do they really care. And then to everybody else, I'm just an extra piece of baggage in the community. And he said, for the first 10 years that I was Muslim, I celebrated Eid by myself. <laughs> 10 years. Can you imagine the loneliness somebody would feel? There are brothers and sisters in our communities who might be immigrants, students who are studying from abroad, can't afford to fly back for Ramadan or Eid. So they're here by themselves, not connected to anyone. There are sometimes immigrant uh, brothers and sisters, especially on the brother's side, a lot of times we see this, that are here working, supporting an entire family back home, again, here by themselves. There might be brothers and sisters, you know, that are divorced or separated. And on and on and on. So many different dynamics in our community. Now we go back to the golden standard. We look at the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ never tolerated anyone being that alone or lonely. And the community of the Prophet ﷺ, the community that we all look up to and we aspire to, you know, when, when it's important for us to study our history and our foundation as an ummah to see what that community was made of. There were immigrants in that community who were completely disconnected. They didn't have a single relative anywhere near them. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a lone soul wandering about for decades until he ended up in Medina. And he wasn't related to anybody. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Salman, minna al bayt. Salman, you belong to my family. You belong to my family. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu and his mother, who were poor people, he was a shepherd, they were poor people, they're from a small little Bedouin village. And again, nobody else from their tribe had accepted Islam. The Sahaba say that when we used to first come to Medina or we first accepted Islam, we were convinced that Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and his mother were related to the Prophet even though they weren't related. Because every time you went to his house, they were there. When the rule came down that take permission before you enter the home of the Prophet the Prophet said to Abdullah bin Mas'ud, idnuka alayya an tarfa al hijab fatadkhul. The way you seek permission to come into my home is you just lift up the curtain, open the door and walk in because you're family. And again, that wasn't excluding all the other rules and regulations. That means that the wives of the Prophet still observed hijab. But that just meant that they inconvenienced themselves to wear hijab most of the time so that this person wouldn't be alone. So that they would have a home. So that they would have a family. One of the most uh, amazing examples that I find in the seerah is of course Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we all know the story of Bilal. He was an immigrant. And on top of that, not that this matters to us, but at that time in that society I'm going to be addressing it was pre-Islamically the Arabian society, like any other society that has not benefited from Islam and Iman. It was a very racist society. So Bilal radiallahu ta'ala being an immigrant, being an African slave, was treated less than human. They used to treat their animals better than they would treat him. He was born into slavery. His mother and father had been separated. The slave master is pre-Islamic. They had separated the mother and father, so he never knew his father. He just knew the name of his father. He didn't even know the name of his grandfather. Lineage was lost. Never knew his father. His mother died in slavery. He eventually was set free. This was Bilal radiallahu anhu. Tortured and beaten, humiliated in that society. How did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa teach him? Treat him? Treat him like family. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was leading the prayer, Bilal was calling the adhan. When Abdullah bin Zayd bin Abdi Rabbi, another Sahabi radiallahu anhu, when he saw the dream in which the angel came down in his dream and taught him how to call the adhan, when he came running to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, Ya Rasulullah, this is what I've seen in my dream, I've been taught how to call the adhan. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, MashaAllah, very good. And then he called Bilal and he said, teach Bilal how to call the adhan, Bilal will call the adhan, subhanAllah. He gets the honor of calling the adhan. When they, when, when Fatih Makkah, the conquest of Makkah occurred, then they purified, they cleansed the Kaaba, Wa Tahir Bayti. Right? Allah said that cleanse my home, my house. 
the Kaaba, the Baytullah. So when the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was cleansed from all the idols and the shirk, and Adhan needed to be called there loudly and proudly, maybe the first time in centuries, he has Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu to climb on top of the Kaaba and call the Adhan from there. And the most remarkable thing I find is, if you, if you look at some of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu the two polar opposites, like they have nothing in common whatsoever. Because we talk about having something in common, right? Oh brother, but you know naturally you gravitate towards people, you have something in common. We do have something in common, Iman. And the Sahaba taught us this. The two companions that had absolutely nothing in common aside from their Iman, and their relationship was the stuff of legend, was Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, let's understand who he was and where he came from. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was nobility. His father Abu Quhafa was a respected leader. I think three generations back his lineage would meets with the Prophet ﷺ. He was a Qurashi, he was a Hashimi, very, very respected. He was born into nobility. He was very educated, very educated. And in fact, he was very intelligent and respected for his intelligence. He was what we would call in our times a genealogist. He knew all the lineages of people. Like all the thousands of people that were in Mecca, he knew everyone's lineage. If somebody walked up from Mecca, he would say, you are Fulan, the son of Fulan, the son of Fulan. He knew people's lineages better than they knew their own family trees. He knew everybody's. Educated, noble, intelligent. Also the lifestyle that he had lived. Even before Islam, he has the distinction of never having committed shirk, never having drank uh, alcohol, never having committed zina, fornication, never having gambled. Even before Islam. And he was wealthy. He was a very successful businessman. So that's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So kind of get the image in your head. He was also known as a community leader and he was an arbitrator. Like when people would have disputes, they would come and put Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in the middle to settle the matter. So now get an image of who he is in your head. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I described to you who he is. Do these two people have anything in common? Aside from their iman, nothing else. And they were so close that people used to refer to Abu Bakr and Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu as brothers. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that my father's closest friend was Bilal. After the Prophet it was Bilal. She says that when he would, when my father would get sick, would get ill, the first one to come visit him would be Bilal. And when Bilal got sick, my father was the first one to go visit him. They were inseparable. They were so close. When they would travel in the Ghazawat, they would travel together. Like they would ride side by side. They would walk side by side. They would share their food and their provision. They were inseparable. Best friends. What's the connection? It's that Iman. So as we're here at the end of the month of Ramadan, even with a day or two left, go out of your comfort zone. Ramadan is about bringing us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but understand for some people, now I'll go back to the ayah that I started from. Inna hadihi ummatukum ummatan wahida. When Allah first talks about our ummah, the sense of ummah, then He says, wa ana rabbukum fa'budun. So He talked about the community before He talked about what we believe in. Wa ana rabbukum. And Allah says, I am your Lord and Master. Fa'budun, so worship only me. Serve only me. But He talks about that second. First He talks about the fact that you're one community. Because understand, just like if there is a crust over something, there is a seal over something. You can have a glass, and but if it's sealed, you can pour water on top of it and the water is just going to splash off. No water is going to go inside that glass. People are human beings. They're people, human beings. They have emotions, sensitivities. And when people are emotionally scarred, like, like a scab, like scar tissue, develops on top of their heart. And it's very painful. And so you can go and take them the message of Iman, but sometimes those wounds, those long-standing wounds that they have on top of their hearts, can sometimes obstruct the ability of that truth to penetrate into their hearts. So you have to very delicately treat their heart first. You have to take care of their heart. You have to remove those scabs, that scar tissue from their heart, to, for them to be able to receive that Iman and that guidance into their heart. And that's why Allah talked about that sense of Ummah and community before. He talked about faith and belief. Because when we start to treat people like family, they'll actually come closer, whether we're talking about Muslims or even non-Muslims. It takes that embracing of people. 
and affection and love and concern and consideration to make them willing and accepting of faith and iman and belief. And I'll share just one personal experience and I'll close with this. We were having our summer program, the summer intensive, the Quran intensive that we do. It's in the Carrollton Masjid, not far from here. And there was a brother who was taking the program. He himself was a convert. He had accepted Islam during high school, I believe he said. And he told me one day that, you know, one of my friends from high school, who's an atheist, um, he's going to be coming here today. I invited him, I asked him to come. So that he can talk to you, ask you some questions, kind of dialogue with you. I said, okay, inshallah khair. And, but what ended up happening is after Maghrib, we have the dars. The brother came right before Maghrib, so we had Maghrib salah, then I have to give the dars, then we had salat al-Isha, dars goes till the Isha. Then I finished the Isha prayer, and then, you know, sunnah and, you know, salam and conversation. And by the time I got out, I was able to sit down and talk. That, bro the, that brother had been there for like two hours. So I was, a little, I was apologizing, I was concerned, and I just said, you know, how's it going? I introduced myself, he introduced himself, asked him, where do you live, where do you go to school, etc., cetera, et cetera, where do you work? Kind of some, getting to know him a little bit better, introduced myself a little bit. And then I sat down with him and I said, okay, so um, your friend, he told me that you have some questions. And he said, no, no questions. I said, wait, but he told me that you had some very specific questions about Islam and faith and belief and God and he's like, no, no, I'm good, no questions. I said, if, just, <laughs> how come you don't have any questions? That's the premise under which you came here. I'm not saying that I have a problem with that, but I'm just trying to figure out, are you just being shy? Are you embarrassed? Or is something else going on here? Because you can ask me. And he, and he told me something. Well, he's straight from his mouth. He said, you know, I got here about two hours ago. And he said, since I got here, I've never been treated as nicely as I was over the last two hours. People, just random people. They don't know me, I don't know them. And I don't even fit in over here. I stick out like a sore thumb. People walking up to me, shaking my hand, saying hi, you know, asking me my name, introducing themselves. I was just sitting there and, you know, a couple of guys came and offered me uh, cold bottles of water. One guy came in and offered me some coffee, some tea that he had just made. And then some guy was, you know, eating dinner a little bit late and he shared his food with me. And people just, and he's like, a couple of people came up, started talking to me, introduced themselves, got to know me, added me on Facebook right there on their phone, exchanged, you know, phone numbers with me, like to stay in touch, what's going on, how's it going? And he's like, I just, I've never experienced anything like this before. So I have no questions. This makes sense. I can see why you'd want to be here. I said, Ajib. Subhanallah. Like he came in with this idea of just, no, I have these problems with this faith and this belief. But it was really, he was just hurting. And once he came into the house, he came into the family. He was like, why wouldn't I want to be here? I feel like I belong here. That's what's at stake. That's what we have to consider. So in these last couple of days of Ramadan, go out of your comfort zone. Step out of your comfort zone and embrace people. Invite somebody to come and have iftar with you. Get to know somebody. Specifically ask them, what, what are you doing on Eid? Come over to my house. Come visit me. Let's go have lunch together on Eid. Reach out to people. And revive that sense of ummah. As I was saying, Ramadan is a time when we come closer to Allah, but for a lot of people, the only way to come closer to Allah is to first be a part of the community. And so Ramadan is supposed to strengthen us as a community. We fast together, we stand and pray together, we do qiyam together, we make dua together, we do every, we recite Quran together. Everybody's doing everything. Look at this. It's the middle of the night and everybody's here. So let's inshallah try to share that love and try to build that sense of community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq and the ability to be able to revive that sense of ummah 
And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our efforts during this blessed month. And in these last couple of nights here, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to uh, really be able to take advantage of this blessed opportunity. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, specifically, I, I know we've probably all been talking about it, but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the suffering of our brothers and sisters all throughout the world. There's a lot of pe places where there's a lot of people in severe suffering. We hear about the news coming from Gaza and other places. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them dignity and honor and peace and tranquility and safety. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise their status in this life and the next. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establish justice and peace throughout the earth. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakum Allah khairan.